College is an investment that can pay off, but for most families it carries substantial cost as well as some risk, in part because admittance does not guarantee that you will leave with a degree. Nationally, the odds that a student will finish a four-year institution within six years are about 60%, but we are not equally successful at supporting all students to graduation. First-generation college students, students of, of underrepresented minority groups, students with low socioeconomic status, all face lower graduation rates after controlling for things like college expectations and incoming test scores. College students face many challenges on the path to graduation, including societal issues, societal biases that affect students just as they do non-students. But college is also its own world. It is inherently different from all of the school that came before it. And because of that, it places a whole suite of new challenges in front of students. It's not necessarily a bad thing because challenge can be good. But we do our students a disservice when we give them challenges without an accompanying toolkit to face them. To do that, we have to first recognize what these new challenges are. We have to talk about them openly. And we have to give our students some guidance on how to deal with them effectively. When we fail to do this, we aren't just making things harder for our students generally. We can inadvertently make existing inequities worse. We can make things hardest for the students who already face extra challenges and for whom early success in college is most critical. I'm an associate professor of biology at the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater. In 2012, I co-founded a program to help address some of these challenges at my own institution called the STEM Boot Camp which supports students historically underrepresented in math and science fields. We are what's called a bridge program, which means that we provide targeted support from the transition from high school to college. Today I'm going to talk about four common challenges that students face as they enter college. I will talk about what STEM Bootcamp does to help prepare our students to meet these challenges, and I will talk about what all students and their families can do to help prepare themselves, even if they don't have access to a program like ours. One of the first new challenges that students face is just picking courses, and this is not a simple task. How many credits are too many? How do you prioritize which classes to sign up for first, and what do you do when they fill up? Picking your classes is also about exploring career paths and making backup plans. It's about picking your major and minor and planning ahead so you don't have to stay extra for one more class. Even for students that have the same career goals, there is no one-size-fits-all. Some students work year-round and others don't. Some students have connections to internship and research opportunities and can afford to work as an unpaid intern and others don't and can't. There are families, there are students that have familial obligations or health concerns that they have to take into account. So with all that to keep in mind, just picking classes can be a big challenge. The next challenge that students face is the way that material is taught. College classes can move quickly and can cover material at greater depth than courses that came before. And the structures of college classes can vary, but the components, lectures and labs and discussion sections, are often all new to new college students. So let's take lecture. Depending on your lecturer, a traditional lecture might be an hour of someone talking to you at great depth about material that you hear once, and then you're expected to understand and be able to apply to new situations. That is a big ask. You are usually encouraged to ask questions during lecture, but that is if you can process the information quickly enough to have them, and then, you know, just raise your hand in front of a scary professor and a whole bunch of people you don't know and put a spotlight on something you don't understand. This situation is just one of those things that the way it's presented makes it very challenging for a lot of students. You are given other tools to help you out with lecture. You are given uh, books, you're given readings, books and papers. You are given uh, often hands-on activities to help you out, but not always. And regardless, it's still on the student to figure out how all of this material fits together on your own time. So how do you do that? How do you take good notes in lecture? And once you have them, how do you study from them? Most of the work of learning in college is supposed to happen outside of the classroom. That class time is supposed to be the tip of the iceberg. But what do you do with all of that time? For most students, the idea of studying might be doing the readings, reading and rewriting your notes, maybe making flashcards. But these are some of the least effective ways of learning. 
For most students, studying a lot is like as many hours as I can stand for a few days, maybe a week before the exam. That is also a really ineffective way to learn. So you can work really hard using these methods and still not learn enough. But who tells us that? And what is the alternative? Again, the challenge itself of uh, being able to learn from all of these different sources is not a bad challenge. Science marches on. Our human understanding marches on. So if you don't want your education to have an expiration date, you can't be totally reliant on your instructors to teach you everything. You have to figure out how to teach yourself. So in that sense, it's a great challenge if you know what you're dealing with and have some idea of how to do it. Another challenge that I want to talk about is the concept of failure. Whether it is literally failing a, a, an assignment or an exam or a class, or just not doing as well as you expected, failure is a very normal part of college. The question is, how do we interpret these moments? Failures can hurt, they can be scary, they can be embarrassing. And it can be really hard to neutrally assess why they happened and what to do about it. If you have family members who went to college, if you feel connected to your faculty and represented by them, if you feel connected to other students, it can be a lot easier to see these things not as failures, but just as challenges or setbacks. There's something that if you keep at it and try another approach, you'll work your way through. But if you don't have that support, it can be a lot easier to assume that the problem is just you. That, there's, that you don't belong in college, or you aren't cut out for this major, or you, aren't, you don't belong at this college. And that is really demotivating. Even if a student sticks with it, if they don't know that there are more effective ways to learn, what do you do? I'll just I'll work harder, I'll study more. More is better than less, but if you're using more of the same ineffective techniques, it still might not be enough. And that brings me to my next challenge, which is getting help. For most classes, the best source of help is usually your professor, since they're the one writing your exams. So we have office hours where we sit in our office and we are available for students to come and ask us questions. This is also a really weird system for students to navigate. For one, it can be very intimidating to come and knock on a professor's door and interrupt them and ask a question. Again, putting a spotlight on something that the student might not feel so good about with this person who they don't know. In class, professors can come across as being professorial. And a lot of my students say that face-to-face -face and office hours, their professors are so much nicer. But you have to go to office hours to find that out. And I don't know if you know any academics, but some of us are a little awkward. So even face-to-face, -face, our students' experience may not be what we think it is. Again, our student, I have students that tell me that they feel like their professors are judging them or are disappointed in them. And that is almost never the instructor's intent. But if it's what our students experience, then that's what shapes their behavior. So unfortunately, it means that the more a student needs help, oftentimes the harder it is for them to come and ask for it. The next trouble with office hours is that a student has to have a question to ask. If a student understands 90% of the material and are, they're only hung up on a couple concepts, that's not too bad. But 90% means that that's a student who already has an A. So what about everybody else? What about everybody who's struggling generally? Without a specific question to ask, a lot of students assume that office hours can't help. And if they do ask a more general question, like the classic, but what do I need to know? What that really means, which is how do I handle all of this material? Professors don't always have a really good answer for that. Not surprisingly, given the strangeness of office hours, students often put off going until they've already struggled and tried and struggled again. And by that point, it's pretty late in the semester and it's really hard to do anything meaningful about their grade. <laughs> students also struggle in class because of what's going on in the rest of their life. <laughs> students might benefit from getting more help with financial aid, with accessing medical and mental health and social support. There are students who don't have enough to eat. There are students who can't sleep, and we need these things for our brains to work. Universities typically have support systems in place for this, but students don't always know that they're there or how to access them. If a student is dealing with something really big, they may also need help in basically dropping a class or navigating or sort of negotiating an extension. And while there are students who try to use those things like 
get out of poor choices free cards, there are also students who don't ask for help when they really probably should. And professors don't always know the difference. A student might say, I'm dealing with personal issues, and that could mean I went out too late for my friend's birthday instead of studying. Or it can mean my dad has cancer, and I'm the only person available to take him to treatments, and by default, I am parenting my little sister. Again, the challenge itself, figuring out how and when to ask for help, is a really good one to get better at. But navigating all of that at 18 in a new place can be a lot. So now we have four challenges. What do we do about them? Our program begins with a two-week session in the summer, just before the freshman year. During this time, we connect students with people and resources to help them on campus. We pair them with faculty mentors and student mentors, so students who are just a couple years older and just navigated the waters that the freshmen are about to enter. During this time, we talk a lot about the challenges that they're likely to face and give them a lot of options for how to avoid them or deal with those problems when they come up. As much as possible for a two-week program, we also try to have our students actually experience the challenges and try out the strategies before the real semester kicks in. So we have workshops on course scheduling and time management. We have workshops on note-taking and how to use readings before lecture so that you can process better during lecture. And then we bring in faculty from science and math courses, professors to come in and give sample lectures from their classes so students can practice these note-taking techniques with different topics and different lecture styles. <coughs> Once students have their notes, we also talk to them about how to learn from them effectively. And we talk a lot about the difference between passive and active learning. Uh, the short version is that passive learning, listening to someone talk, or reading a book are a great start, but they are not very effective ways of learning on their own. It's really easy to hear something and say, oh, yeah, okay, that makes sense. But it's also easy to forget it, and it's really easy to misunderstand it. So students that learn this way often feel really good, but then they get to an exam and they have to put it in their own words and apply it in a new way, and they don't understand it well enough to do that. So we have our students practice active learning techniques. We have them take their notes and create a new study tool out of them. Things like concept maps, flow charts, tables. Regardless of the method, what the students are doing is taking all of this information and putting it all into their own words. At the same time, they're organizing it, so they have to really think about how all these pieces of information fit together. By doing that, they're learning the material much better. They often stumble across questions that they didn't even know they had, and then they're left with a physical tool that they can study from. Once they have their study tools, we use class critiques so the students can all learn from each other and to emphasize the fact that these are skills that get better with practice. In doing this, it also allows our students to get a sense of how much time they realistically need to set aside outside of the class time to keep up. Uh, active, studying to, active studying methods takes time. Um, and on top of that, lectures build on one another. So realistically, it means students need to be doing this multiple times a week for every class on their schedule. That really adds up. Another important concept in our program is, is mindset. Essentially, we want our students to know that getting, having setbacks and getting help are both essential parts of being in college. We want our students to view setbacks as simply indications that they need to change or refine their approach so that they can grow through the challenge and come out stronger on the other side. To normalize setbacks for them, we have a lot of really open discussions with the professors, with the peer mentors, and the students about times when we have all faced academic setbacks and dealt with them effectively, and times when we have dealt with them ineffectively. We also teach our students to go to office hours by the second week of classes, even if they have no questions. At the very least, if they run into trouble later, it's a lot easier to go back because they already have a relationship with the professor. During our two-week program, our sample lecturers or our guest lecturers also have mo like mock office hours. And so students go, and it normalizes this very weird process before the semester even begins. We also give our students a game plan. If they have clear questions on the material, those come first. If they don't have questions on the material, we have them bring those study tools that they made and share them with the professor for feedback. This, by the way, is a guaranteed win. For one, it allows the professor to really quickly assess where the student is, if there are any misunderstandings, or if there's anything that can be added or improved. 
And at the same time, it shows the professor that that student is really dedicated. So it sets that professor-student relationship up to be a win. So that is all part of our two-week program. And then during the school year, we have additional check-ins to help reinforce the concepts they learned in the summer. We have weekly lunches where program alumni can all get together and basically just share perspectives when things come up. It also allows us to make sure that we can connect students to other resources when they need them. Our students are doing extremely well. They are passing their core STEM classes. These are the big five credit math and science courses that we track at really high rates, up to 100% for one. <laughs> um, they're doing great. We are also retaining students at higher rates. So retention is up for every year progressing through college. Graduation rates for our first few groups of students, those that we have, have been around long enough for us to track these data, are up as well by about 13% so far. I have to point out here that our students have done all of this. This is entirely a result of their work and their dedication. They would have brought these strengths to us regardless. We did not change who they are. We did not change their classes. We certainly did not fix the societal issues they are dealing with. But to me, that is the point. If we are open and honest about what college is and what to expect, how to approach it effectively, if we provide faculty and peer mentors, and if we give students the space to be that support for each other, that can make the difference between amazing people who don't have college degrees and amazing people who do. So what can other students do if you're not in this program? One is to use advisors and plan ahead. At my institution, students have to talk to an advisor before they can sign up for classes every single semester. If your university does not do that, you can still seek advising out. You can go to an advising center or just talk to someone in your department. When you talk to your advisor, talk to them about your goals and plans. Ask if there are any other opportunities they can think of that will help you get there. And tell them if you're going to be working or have any other stressors on your time. Don't assume that your circumstances are universal or that the advisor knows what they are without you telling them. Ultimately, the schedule is yours to choose. So do plan ahead and be mindful of taking on too much. It can feel like, like piling on the courses is going to save you time and money, but if you take on too much, it can set you back and it can cost you a lot more in the long run. Number two. Uh, use these active learning techniques. Even if you're one of most students and no one's talked to you about this concept before, you can still learn, you can still use these active learning techniques as you study. There are tutorials you can try. You can just try them out. Don't expect them to work perfectly right away because these are skills that get better with practice. Number three, expect setbacks. And when they happen, remember what they're telling you. You're being challenged and you're your understanding and your skills aren't there yet. It does not mean they cannot be developed. So when you experience a setback, I always tell my students, feel your feelings first, then assess. <laughs> look at your schedule. Look at your attendance. Look at your notes to see if they are accurate and complete. Look at how and when you're studying, and then figure out which of those things can you realistically change for the next quiz, the next exam, or even the next semester. And finally, Build connections and get help. Find out and learn about and use your university support systems. They are there because they are necessary. Go to office hours early and often and go with a game plan. When you're in your courses, set up your own study groups. Just set a time and a place, just once a week even. Tell the instructor to announce it to the class and see who shows up. Even if nobody does, at the very least, you are setting aside the time that you need for all of that active learning. If you do these things, you will also slowly build that support network that you need. You will find the other dedicated students. You will find the professors. You will find the other people, the administrators in the university that you can connect with and learn with. Ultimately, a university is a resource. Everything that we have is supposed to be there to challenge and support our students. I am still looking for better ways to support our students on the transition into college. Hopefully I've shared something today that can help others do the same. Thank you.